Hey guys, it's Richard, you're watching The Plain Bagel. If you're someone who's looked into income investments to try and generate cash flow off of your portfolio that maybe you can live off of, or you've just generally explored the idea of options trading to try and augment or maybe even improve your return, then you've probably at some point or another come across the concept of covered calls. A strategy that, simply put, involves you continually selling derivative contracts off of your portfolio investments to rake in the premiums as a form of passive income. This has long been a popular strategy for active traders, but these days is more available to others as well. Uh, given that if you don't want to go through the effort of creating your own covered call strategy and managing your own derivative contracts, there are now covered call ETFs or exchange traded funds where you let a fund manager do the work for you, which is where we get funds like XYLD, an S&P 500 ETF that yields over 10% compared to VOO, a standard S&P 500 ETF yielding under 2%. And right away, you can see the appeal and why this is such a popular approach. A lot of people view covered calls as a way of generating bonus income off of their investment portfolio. But it's important going into security like this that you understand both the benefits as well as the drawbacks, which certainly exist here. Not too long ago, we covered a video discussing a covered call strategy with Nvidia stock, which perfectly demonstrates the possibly expensive trade-off that comes with this strategy. So in today's video, I wanted to debunk some of the common misconceptions about covered calls without highlighting them as a scam or say, a overly risky strategy, because in the world of options, certainly one of the more conservative ways of using them. And if used properly, it can hedge your downside, which is worth highlighting, but it's not automatically a superior source of return like a lot of people will present it. Uh, so we'll provide all the details, the benefits, but also the drawbacks that you need to be aware of if you decide to use covered calls. But let's go over the basics of what a covered call strategy is. You can skip this section using these chapters in the description down below. And this part will get a little technical at times, but it is important to the overall uh, discussion we'll have about the pros and cons. Simply put, a covered call strategy refers to an investor owning a stock and simultaneously selling call options for that position. A call option is a contract that gives the buyer the temporary right, but not the obligation, to buy a given position at a specified strike price. So an investor who owns a stock and sells a call option is effectively giving someone else the right to buy the position they own at some point in the future. As an example of this, let's say that we have a call option on Microsoft stock. We'll say that the share is currently trading at $400, which is the market value, and the call option has a premium of $4. So if you wanna buy this right to buy Microsoft, you have to pay $4 upfront. And let's say these are the terms of the call option. It will expire in 30 days, after which it is useless, and has a strike price of $420, meaning that at any point over the next 30 days, the person who has purchased this call option can buy it at that price. And because this strike price is above the current market price, meaning it's currently not profitable to exercise, it is an out of the money call option just meaning that it's not currently profitable. So those are the terms if you buy the call option. You obviously are betting that the stock price will increase past the strike price so that you can make a profit. Uh, but as mentioned with a covered call strategy, we're actually selling a call option, which just means that we flip the payoff. That means that up front, you're actually paid that $4 premium from selling the call option, after which you're hoping that that option will not be exercised and you can keep that premium. So generally you would sell a call option if you expected the stock to fall in value or be flat over the near term. Now, if you were just to sell a call option, you'd face the following payoff chart, which uh, might look confusing, but the x-axis represents the stock price for Microsoft, and the y-axis is your profitability for selling this call option. So you can see that if the stock price stays the same or falls downwards, you keep that entire $4 premium, but if the price starts to increase, you actually face uncapped downside. And that's because regardless of how high the stock price rises, you will have the obligation if your call option is exercised to go into the market, pay that higher price, and then sell the security for $420. So if the stock price were to rise to 500, $1,000, $10,000, which would be pretty unrealistic, but technically a possibility, you would be on the hook for that difference which introduces quite a significant amount of risk. But that's where the term covered call comes from because at the same time you're selling the call option, you're also buying the stock for that obligation so that you don't face that uncapped downside. You have the security ready on hand to meet that future obligation. And if you graph the payoff for the covered call strategy, you can see that it gets rid of that infinite downside risk. Uh, 
which is good. <laughs> so that's the strategy for covered calls. And people online will often say that it gives you three different sources of return. Uh, the dividends on the shares you are selling covered calls on because you still generate that while the covered call is outstanding. Uh, the price appreciation up to the strike price since you're selling out of the money call options and you can still benefit from a small rise in the stock's price. And a third new one, which is the income you generate by selling these call options. Because every time that 30 day period passes and if a call option is uh, goes expired unused, then you can sell a new call option on the same position and once again generate that premium. And people also sometimes refer to it as a bit of a downside hedge because if your portfolio stays flat or falls in value, then you'll have outperformed having just held the stocks if you at the same time sell call options on the positions you hold. Yes, your portfolio has still fallen in value, but that's lessened a bit by the income you've generated uh, through this exercise. And to be clear, there's certainly some merit to these benefits, uh, but while that all sounds great so far, there are some pretty big and important to know drawbacks of this strategy. Again, we describe the strategy as providing three sources of return that obviously sounds superior to just the boring old two sources of return you would otherwise see, the dividends and price appreciation. But what's not often highlighted is that that third source of return is only created by greatly restricting the second source of return, the price appreciation. As you can see with the payoff graph, the covered call strategy caps your upside uh, because the benefit of any appreciation beyond the strike price will be passed off to the person you sold the call option to. So a covered call strategy does hedge your downside, it also sort of hedges your upside and cuts off that tail end positive return that you might experience. So if you carried out the covered call strategy using the Microsoft example we highlighted earlier, and let's say in that 30 day period, Microsoft jumps 50%, your return would be a mere 6%. On top of this, there are some other downsides worth highlighting. Uh, for one, covered call ETFs, because it involves more trading activity, tend to charge a higher management expense ratio. Uh, that XYLD covered call S&P 500 ETF we highlighted charges a fee of 0.6% versus Vanguard's standard S&P 500 ETF, which charges 0.03%. Covered call strategies can also be less tax efficient because even though the premiums you generate from the selling of call options is generally considered a capital gain, in the US it would be considered what's called a short-term capital gain, which means that they don't get the preferential tax treatment of normal capital gains. And because the positions in your portfolio might see the options exercise, uh, meaning that you have to sell and then if you wanna stay in the position, buy back the stock again, you're gonna to have to report the capital gain for tax purposes every time that occurs, which really removes the tax benefit of deferring taxes through uh, unrealized capital gains. And on that point, while well, you might think to yourself, well, I'll just buy back the position every time a call gets exercised so that I can sell more call options. If the stock price continually fluctuates up and down, even if it's flat over the long term, you can find yourself holding fewer and fewer shares of the company in question and end up realizing a loss, even if the position is flat over the long term. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, Richard, no problem. I'll only do covered call strategies for positions that I know are going to be flat in the short term, and I'll just increase my strike price for the call options to a point where I'm nearly 100% sure that it's not going to reach. And certainly that's something that would reduce your risk with this strategy. The problem there, of course, outside the fact that there's really no predicting the short-term performance of a stock, uh, is that the call option price will reflect how likely it is for that call to be exercised. The less volatile a stock, the higher the strike price you set, and the shorter the amount of time until its expiration, the lower the option premium that you'll be paid for selling this option. It's all reflected in the market value. In other words, the more likely you are to make money by selling call options, the less money you'll make. To the point where eventually, you're cutting off the tail end chance of superb performance for effectively pennies. And that matters because a lot of portfolio performance is determined by a handful of days of outperformance. And if you're continually writing call options on the positions you hold, you're all but certain to miss those important days. It's why when you compare the index funds we highlighted earlier, the covered call strategy, even with its 10% yield, has actually underperformed. Now I have seen some highlight online that, well, yes, covered call strategies might earn a lower total return, they have a superior risk adjusted return, meaning that per unit of risk that you're taking on, you are earning a better return using covered calls than when you take on the market risk and earn the market return. And a lot of this is based on using the Sharpe ratio, which is a function of return over standard deviation. And the higher the Sharpe ratio, generally speaking, the higher the risk 
adjusted return. I've also seen a lot of people describe covered call strategies as like taking the position of the casino, uh, where you're selling, charging these premiums to a bunch of gamblers and speculators in the market, but earning a superior return with those premiums because the house always wins and all these traders in the market are irrational. The problem when it comes to risk adjusted return, however, is that standard deviation is not an appropriate measure of risk when it comes to options strategies, because the return distribution or uh, the distribution or possibilities of outcomes when you sell a call option doesn't follow a normal distribution. Now I know saying that probably triggers some flashbacks to university stats class, and I'm not gonna get into too much detail, but the short of it is that the Sharpe ratio assumes that your return distribution looks like this, uh, when in reality, it's more like this, with the right tail of the distribution being completely cut off, again, because you're capping your upside. So the reason Sharpe ratios look more attractive for covered call strategies is because they're only telling part of the story. They're ignoring what's called the skewness of the return distribution or the outcome distribution. And skewness obviously matters to our returns. We keep the negative tail end risk while eliminating the tail end on the upside. Now it's not to say a covered call strategy might not outperform. Maybe uh, with some active analysis, you happen to identify a call option that you believe to be overpriced. So you benefit from that arbitrage by selling those call options. Uh, but clearly you probably shouldn't be carrying out a covered call strategy if you're looking to generate income passively without the necessary research or analysis that really should be involved with it. And even if you do carry out the active analysis, of course, there's no guarantee. And it's incredibly difficult to predict where markets will move in the short term. In most cases, you're gambling which direction the market's going to go over a very short period of time. And for every call option that you sell, you have to keep in mind that there's a trader on the other end of it who disagrees with you and might be better informed. So covered call strategies are not a scam or inherently a risky strategy from a total return perspective. Uh, but when compared to just holding the underlying portfolio, it clearly has its trade-off. And I guess that's the main takeaway here, which is that as with everything in investments, you have to gauge your expectations. Uh, there's no free lunch when it comes to risk and return. Uh, they go hand in hand and you aren't breaking this relationship and magically generating free income and superior terms of return using a covered call strategy. You're really just shifting the risk around. And while yes, the income might appeal to someone who wants to say, uh, withdraw cash from their portfolio, Again, with our example, you would have been better off just holding the underlying positions and selling a little bit to generate that cash rather than using a covered call strategy for that income. So none of this is to tell you how to invest, uh, but if you do decide to use covered calls, A, make sure that you're well-informed. Options are a powerful and very dangerous tool, uh, so you shouldn't be using them as a beginner. And B, unless you're using a covered call ETF, make sure that you're more actively involved to ensure that you aren't taking on excessive risk. And if all that sounds too complicated or not worth the effort, Great. <laughs> uh, most people will be served perfectly fine with a simple buy and hold strategy. And as with our example, you would have done better holding the positions regardless. Anyway, that's a video. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you found it helpful. If you did, please do make sure to like, subscribe, all that good stuff. It does help the channel tremendously. And let me know your thoughts in the comments down below, especially if you are someone who uses a covered call strategy. I'd be happy to hear your input on this, whether you agree or disagree. Thanks for joining me today. And as always, be safe out there.